and uh, with his uh, Bonanza flying uh, uh, cross country and had to do an engine out landing. So we're going to talk about that real quick. But before we do that, Jeff, could you tell us a little bit about your background? How did you get into flying and what do you do now? Uh, my, my father, father was a mechanic, mechanic with Eastern Airlines, had a little airplane, airplane. Uh, uh, solo, solo when I was 16, 16 private, private, when I was, when 17. I was 17, and, and uh, uh, got, got a lot of scholarship, went into the Air Force, Force. And, and really didn't fly, fly single, single engines, engines again until 1997 or so, or so, so uh, that, that was, was a big, big Change, change in mentality, mentality versus, versus what I had been flying. Uh, uh, got to see if I, well, I instructed, I instructed in the Air Force, Force and, and I got a little reciprocity uh, uh, with the FAA, FAA and got a CFI in 2004. Did some volunteer, did some volunteer work, work with the Civil Air Patrol, Patrol and some of the pilots that I met. I've really done it from higher. Okay. Hey, real quick, uh, uh, Samuel's saying there's pretty bad feedback from you, so maybe pull that uh, uh, that earplug out, and hopefully we'll fix that. Uh, I, I think I turned your volume down for a minute. Okay. Okay, Scott, okay, Scott, say, Scott something. say something. Uh, okay, how's that? I'm also, uh, do you have, yeah, by yeah, chance, Scott. yeah, can you hear me? How does how's that? Do you hear now? You there? Yeah. Okay. So I'm also saying somebody says that uh, you might uh, actually it's Brian. Hey Brian, um, saying that you might have a YouTube uh, in one of your tabs up. Do you hear me now? I can. I can hear you. Oh, I got. I got. I got. <laughs> Sam saying it's pretty sig significant echo still. All right. The wonders of modern I technology. Know, something there, but I got that now. How's that? Joys of, yep, absolutely. Joys of technology. Uh-oh. It's the infamous frozen screen. It's social distancing. It's the social distancing elbow. <clears throat> Brian, you could say something funny here. <laughs> All right, he's back. Hey, you're moving. Okay, where were we? You were telling us, uh, oh, what'd you do? What'd you fly in the Air Force? I went, uh, I went to KC-135 in the beginning and uh, T-37s. T I spent two total of four years in the Air Force. Yeah. Oh. It's a touch and go. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> I always like KC-135 guys. Uh, they were they were my favorites. He says that, Brian says it's not terrible sound, but it sounds like a slight half second echo. Oh well. But well, anyway. It's a lot better for me. Good. Well, hopefully uh, it's tolerable on the, on the YouTube end. So um, anyway. You've been doing, uh, you were flying for the Air Force, you, you got out of that and you started flying for the airline and uh, it wasn't enough flying, so you had to buy a Bonanza. Not a Cirrus, Brian, so. not a Cirrus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I want to fly, fly one of those ones too. Yeah, me too. I always liked it. So you got your Bonanza and uh, you're flying, uh, you went to get your brother and you're bringing him back home. Well, well, yeah, yeah I, was I was up in the northeast. North 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 I had a little time to do some discretionary flying, but I had to fly all over the place, place and, and I wound up in the northeast. North he had he mentioned over the course of a couple of years that he was thinking about getting back into it, and I said, hey, I'll go back to Nashville until I want to along. And he was all about it, so I took him on board, and we started out. In Albany, Albany, where he where lives, and we got back to two hop down, down to Nashville, where I live, and, and uh, had, uh, had a couple, couple of days of beautiful, beautiful weather. weather. And, and it was going to be good weather. weather. Uh, 
As, As we, we got, got closer, closer to Nashville, Nashville the clouds were getting taller and taller. So, so the winds, the best the winds, winds were down, down like 4,500 4, feet, feet, but we climbed to 10,500 uh, 10, towards the end just, just to get around. around still, still pretty, pretty widely wide scattered, scattered towering, towering cumulus clouds. Stay in getting a nice ride on 10,500. Since, since he wants, he wants to, get to get back, get back into flying, flying, I asked him, hey, hey, how much do you want me to talk? And he, he told me pretty much to pontificate the whole way. So, Along the way, I showed him the things that were different nowadays versus when he was flying three decades ago, and that helped the feedback. I don't hear myself anymore. That's good, Scott. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so um, the iPad is different now. He'd never seen that being used in an airplane. I've got my sectional chart on it. On four flight, and another feature that they have on four flight is a little circle that I have turned on that shows how far I can glide should I lose an engine. And a couple of years ago, I researched what number to put in there.、Uh, I wound up for my Bonanza G35 putting in 10.2, and、uh, I, along the way, have practiced using that circle. To make sure that it was going to work for me, we talked about the other things that I usually instruct when it comes to losing an engine in single-engine airplane. And、uh, we talked about all, a whole bunch of other things too. We were getting flight following the whole way, and we were getting real close to home. I about 35 minutes from touchdown. I lived on an air park, and、uh, about 35 minutes away from there, at 10,500. And the、uh, the engine sounded like it was、uh, feeding from a tank that was running out of gas, and I didn't think that was possible because I've got a 20 gallon tank that I already burned 10 gallons out of, and、um, so、uh, I switched tanks anyway, and that didn't help, and、uh, I went. Did all the things that John and I had just talked about. Went to Rich, and I looked at the fuel pressure. We got the wobble pump, but I had good fuel pressure.、Uh, all my engine instruments. I pulled out the carb heat, which shouldn't have been a problem. It wasn't a problem.、Uh, looked at the、uh, ignition. Played around with that switch a little bit, and、uh, nothing was going to get the engine to run right. And、uh, At 10:5, we were either going to slow down or lose altitude, or ultimately both. I, I was losing altitude at that point, and、uh, right around then, Memphis Center gave me a frequency change. <laughs> so, of course, I had, yeah, didn't mention to him that I was having any trouble. I just thought it would add complexity. I、uh, took the frequency change and、uh, switched over to the new frequency and. Told the new guy when I checked on what my problem was, but during that time I looked at the ring and where I could go within that ring, and、uh, there was one airport that I think I on the radio called Lafayette. No, no, I I called it Lafayette, but I've been told it's Lafayette.、Uh, it, yeah, it depends anyway, on where you are. You know how they how they how they say that around here, around these parts. I think it's Lafayette. But、uh, there were two restricted airports inside that circle too, and the thing about them is there's no way of knowing how long the runway is, or if it's still there, frankly, or a lot of other things. And、uh, this Lafayette, which was farther away, was inside the circle, and the circle was there for a reason to tell me I could make it as long as I didn't screw it up. I knew I could make it, and that's kind of huge there, just to know that there is a solution to this problem. Um, during that time, I also saw an airport in the town where my daughter lives, and I know a mechanic. It was outside the ring, and I still had a couple cylinders firing, and it did cross my mind to try to stretch it. And I just told myself real quick how stupid that was, and, and dismissed that thought and、uh, concentrated on getting to Lafayette. So by the time I switched over to it was Nashville approach, 
I told them I wasn't going to go to my destination. He knew what my destination was already because of setting up the flight following. And uh, I told him I'm not going to go because I've lost some power on the engine. And he came right back and said, do you want to declare an emergency? And, uh, yeah, I mean, I had no problem about that. And uh, so he fed me. Let's see, what did he ask me? I guess um, somehow, oh, he told me, he fed me that the runway there was runway 19. And I asked him, uh, do you happen to know the winds? So it saved me the trouble of finding the frequency and listening to it. And uh, he said, no, but I know the winds at Nashville are 220, whatever they were, probably 10 knots or so, uh, went out the other ear. But um, I, I got the direction right. And uh, I said, okay, that's good enough. I'm anxious to get over to the frequency, the common frequency for Lafayette and start telling everybody I'm coming because I want them to get out of my way. Um, and uh, right about there, uh, part of what I teach when you lose an engine is don't forget to look at the checklist because there's some ideas on there that might help you out. So I picked up the card and I handed it over to my brother and I flipped it over the back side where it said emergency and I told him to uh, look at that and see what I was forgetting because I knew that if you're going to land with an engine failed, turn the battery switch off, crack the door open, a couple other things, um, turn the fuel off. But none of that was going to apply. I wanted what I had on my engine. I wanted to be able to use it if I had to on one hand. On the other hand, I had it throttled back to idle because something had let loose. I didn't know what. And I didn't want to tempt it to really fly apart. So uh, what I was going to do now is just concentrate on getting it down. And like I say, I'd practiced before. And in the past, uh, I about a year ago with my son, I had it set up pretty nice, I thought. But the airplane sank a lot more than I realized with the gear down and no power. And uh, that time in practice, I had to add a little power. So I made a mental note of that. And um, more recently, I was out there again. This is something I, I guess I suggest everybody do. Um, you're going to an airport. You got that ring. As soon as the ring is, as soon as the airport's inside the ring, go back to idle and see if you can get it down. So uh, I had done that probably a month and a half prior with another guy, and I did get it down, remembering the first time how much it sinks, because uh, it, it does surprise me. So anyway, I wound up over the field. Every, every call I was making, I was throwing in emergency aircraft in case somebody decides to cut in front of me or something crazy like that. Uh, probably got over the field about 3,000 feet, I actually know the numbers, probably uh, 2,500 feet over the field. I felt like that was plenty of altitude, probably still at least 100 miles an hour. So I uh, went ahead and put the gear down there. And what I'm trying to do is get to the perch, which is on downwind, right of beam the numbers. Normally, every day, I'm going to be 1,000 feet. So I want to be high on that for a single engine if I can do it. Uh, single engine, zero engine. Um, and I did, I was probably, I was probably 1500 feet. Um, and now the gear's down, no flaps. And um, I, based on my experience, wanted to start that base a little early so that I wind up on final with uh, more extra energy. And I did, I wound up about half mile final and 100 miles an hour, where a normal approach speed to be 80, maybe a little bit high on glide path. And uh, at that point, I went ahead and did my gump check, which is gonna make sure that my gear's down mainly. Um, I went through the other stuff and I caught the fact that I hadn't even thought about my prop this whole time. It was probably set, uh, whatever I was using up at cruise altitude at that point, which probably helped me with my glide, although 
we can talk about what airspeed I flew, which was not best, uh, best range. So anyway, here I am, I'm final, high and fast, so um, I, I put it in a deep slip, which is in my bag of tricks if this ever happens to me, but I feel like in practice you can't really do it because there's a 30 second restriction on slips in my aircraft because of uh, unporting the fuel. So I did use it with the real thing and now there's a helicopter calling me, which I just ignored. I guess it was Nashville approach, wanting to make sure I was on the ground, but I wasn't. And uh, I just ignored him, got it down to what looked like a normal glide path and put flaps down, landed, and uh, in the flare, I pulled back on the throttle. In fact, on final, I added some power a little bit and uh, just to see what was there. And there was, there was some life in the engine, but it was very out of balance. So I didn't need it anyway. I came back to idle. And, um, well, I pulled it back. And then in the flare, I pulled it back some more, make sure it's at idle. And at that point, it quit. It quit during the rollout. So... Uh, I was on the ground, had whatever touchdown speed I had, taxiways coming up, I cleared the taxiway and went, uh, I don't know, 40 feet beyond that, came to a stop, and my brother and I climbed out of the airplane. Oh, before we did, uh, now Baron's trying to call us on the radio, and now I had time to answer him, and uh, I told him we were down and safe, and plus, oh yeah, and the descent, before the controller let me go to this frequency, uh, he gave me a phone number to call, so I called them. All he wanted to know is souls on board and fuel on board. So he was happy. I haven't heard another thing. There's uh, been no penalty to declare an emergency, no paperwork or anything like that. I think one of the reasons that I, I wrote up the story was so that I'd have it straight in case they ever did, but it didn't happen. Yeah, well, I think that's an excellent idea is to take some notes um just a uh we'll hopefully we'll open it up for some questions here in just a second but just a few comments one is is you did it and you did it you got it back on the ground in one piece and that was excellent and making that choice from my perspective of well i'm not going to try to stretch it and go to this place that i know is going to be good for me well it's not good for the airplane it's not good for the energy you have so the what's going to work is to go to Lafayette or Lafayette or however you pronounce it. So that was an excellent decision and probably the bedrock of, uh, of the whole uh, successful outcome of the incident. Well, um, uh, my son and I had uh, carefully watched your uh, little video on the PC-12 that passed up on a good piece yeah. of concrete over there in Dallas. And um, he reminded me of that when I told him this story. So there's that one thing. Yeah. Well, I got another. Uh, this is just a slight digression. It's in the Air Force. I was a, I was on an, a, I was a pilot member of a safety board investigating an accident. F fours. I flew F fours at the time. And uh, this fellow crashed on short final at the airbase, but he passed up five divert airports. He got into trouble because it's not the point bringing it back home. You know, it's, it, okay, the maintainers are going to love it. They're going to get TDY. So that's, you know, that's fine. Uh, it's the safe. The safe answer is the best answer all the time. So good, good. Um, a quick comment about speeds um, and altitudes. Um, so when I do, when I teach, I preach best glide. First thing you do is, is you, you turn towards uh, a, an, a divert point, you know, in other words, for me, the you know having what I'm thinking about is a field first, and then if within that glide ring on four flight, I use four flight. I've got Garmin Pilot too, but I, I, I prefer four flight. If I have an airport, well then now it's kind of earning my diversion. That's where I'm going. This is what my thought process is. But I'm going to set my speed. So best glide's 110 knots, miles an hour would be a little bit uh, more than that. But uh, uh, then it's the decision on whether you actually need that distance or not. When your 10.2 is based on your best glide speed, your, your glide ratio was based on the best glide speed. But that, I'm, all I'm telling you is this is the book answer and this is what kind of what ABS preaches, 
But what you did, in effect, as you mentioned the altitudes you were at, that's exactly where you want to be for high key, 2,500 feet over the field. And the book says, put your gear down there, uh, or ABS talks about that. And then it's 1,500 at low key, which is perch. What for y'all y'all out there, we're Air Force guys, uh, base to, you, when you turn base, that's perch. To me, it's always been the perch. And, uh, and I know what he's saying, but a lot of y'all out there may not realize that it's turn base. And uh, so, but, but uh, anyway, 1,500 that. And then on final, generally, you're going to be about 7 to 800 feet. Because your descent rate's pretty phenomenal. It's, uh, it's pretty uh, eye-opening. Well, uh, Scott, when I teach what speed to go to, yes, I, I teach best range first. But I also, when I feel the student's ready for it, I introduce the fact that it isn't always as simple as that. Sometimes mm -hmm. you may want to have more time and best endurance would be better. Yes. And in the case of me on this one, I knew I had it made. And I felt like time was my enemy. If my engine's going to fly apart, I want to get it on the ground. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, if I had needed to, I had a lot of things that were in my favor. I, just starting out at 10,500. Yeah. Uh, That's energy in the pocket. It was lucky. Yeah. It was lucky. Um, if but, you're at 4,500 uh, still, you probably would have been landing in a field. And, and one of the thoughts that went through my head was, I don't want to throw my airplane away today, and I know I have to. I have to do that if yeah. if that's what I have to do. Yeah, There's... and I'll, I'll mention also that uh, those num ABS numbers I've seen them and I've gone through their course and they don't stick in my head that well. What what I yeah. what I what does stick in my head is that I see a normal downwind and a normal base and final all the time. And if I add some energy to that, then I got something to work with. Um, well, I had another thought there. Yeah, I can't remember. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, I was just going to say that uh, um, being able to judge and feel your energy uh, in the airplane and, and whether it's appropriate to do what you want to do, in this case, go to Lafayette, uh, in your case, um, I'm, I'm not criticizing you. I, I, there's no way I'm going to do that. What I'm saying is, is just that's kind of the the general course of what we teach in the ABS, but in, in the you know B triple P world. Um, but uh, if you've got the feel What's for the good energy, stuff? yeah. If you've got the feel for the energy in the airplane, that's exactly what you need, and uh, and to be able to make that all work out like that. One comment. I do have one comment because I preach a lot. I, my soapbox really is this engine out thing, and uh, among a couple others, but engine outs. And uh, um, is the airplane, you talked about saving the airplane. My view is if it fails you in flight, regardless of what it fails, you know, it's the engine or whatever, its sole job now, its sole existence, sole purpose in life is to get you back on the ground in one piece. And if you can reuse the airplane, that's totally awesome. Yeah, I, I agree with you. It's just when you're there, knowing <laughs> I, yeah. that this is one of the things on the table, uh, you know, I just wasn't ready to throw my airplane away that day. The, the other thought I had was that um, I'm mentally prepared to land gear up, if that's what I... Frankly, if, if it's in a field, I'll probably land gear up. I think that's an excellent idea. I actually did the review of Bonanza accidents uh, for last year, 2019. And uh, the number of uh, the people who landed on unprepared surfaces with the gear down, the majority of them had at least one fatal in the airplane. And those that landed gear up, some of them were hurt pretty badly, but there were no fatals. And I've actually got an upcoming video of a uh, of a uh, an inadvertent <laughs> uh, gear up landing in a Bonanza, and we'll talk about the damage that you see. Um, it's really minimal. It really is uh, minimal. So I don't. I, Do you I happen would, to know uh, on the inadvertent case what the stopping distance was? Uh, yeah, it's less than 300 feet. Okay. 
I like the sound of that. Even on a prepared surface, yeah. it frankly is safer. <laughs> it if is. You're worried about the length of this field that you're putting it in, and you're going to pick out a field that hopefully you're going to be able to use the whole field. But I think there's also some accidents out there where the guy came up short and wound up hitting a ditch in the road next to the field and you know, died because of that. Yeah. So you got to have just a little bit extra to make sure you make it to the field. I agree, absolutely. Do you have enough stopping ability uh, before the other end of the field? Yeah. Uh, well, one of the things I, I actually just did a video on uh, kind of proficiency flying series that I'm putting together, and one was the engine out practice. So the actual end game of what you just did, and um, my target um, turn point instead of the normal numbers is now going to be about a third of the way down the runway. That's where I'm going to turn. And in this, on the video itself, uh, I didn't have the gear down. I didn't do like you did and put the gear down at 2,500 feet. I wasn't overhead the field. And I actually had to dodge some clouds to, to get there. But um, so I judged that I didn't have the energy to do that. And for me, then, my decision is, is well, I'm going to make the field. And I have to earn the situation where I can put the gear down. But then back it up because it takes 14 seconds to put the gear down in the F-33C. It's a 12-volt airplane, so it's not that fast. So anyway, my it has to earn the situation where I put the gear down. I want it to, but uh, I'm not necessarily yeah. going to. So that's yeah. kind of how, how I deal with, deal with that. But uh, that's awesome. So I want to congratulate you for a well done uh, well done, well handled emergency. So well, uh, thank you. Um, let me just do a plug for flight following. Yeah, I, I haven't filed a VFR flight plan in a long time because I really feel like it's archaic. And obviously, that Nashville guy wanted to know I was on the ground safe, and if I wasn't, he was going to be. He knew where I was, and he was going to be sending somebody out to find me. So yeah. In general, controllers are great folks. They want to help. They want to do everything they can. You help me they're, out. Yeah, they're on the edge of their seat. I want to help you out. And most of the time, what and they do. And he already knows yeah. who I am. Yeah. Where I'm based. All kinds of stuff. So. I will tell you a little. I will tell you a little interesting thing about what happens on the handoff. So when you when you did this handoff, most of the time, I'm not saying all the time. I'm not a controller. I did sleep at Holiday Inn Express, but. Uh, uh, I used to be married to a controller. Uh, anyway, they they generally <laughs> coordinate the <laughs> they generally coordinate the handoff before you actually run out of their airspace. So, in your case, it sounded like you were actually headed towards the the gaining controller's airspace, so it wasn't a huge deal. So, well, I've I've seen it happen though when you get a you get the handoff happen and you're still inside the other guy's airspace, and he says. You ask him the new one for something, and he goes, ah, I can't do anything for you on that. you got to go a few more miles. So, yeah. you know, it, it, but it, when you're in an emergency, you're in an emergency. you got to do what you got to do. Declare the emergency. Don't hesitate because it's uh, it's all in your favor. That's the thing. Is you, it, you, it's you that's you. important now. <laughs> so, cool. Well, there's a couple of folks asking about uh, what happened since the engine was still running but not making power um, and you know now what happened could you uh, tell everybody it was a stuck valve I had a engine monitor on board that I didn't think to look at and if I had it would have shown me that the EGT was much cooler on number six uh, I downloaded the data, data on the computer when I got home so um, valve just stuck open and uh, there was a nice EAA uh, webinar oh, about a week ago why valves stick and I, I watched that with interest and they pretty much blamed it on leaded fuel and um, a temperature range which is not optimum for uh, valve sticking anyway if you get down below 350 degrees a lot that's uh, conducive to leaving deposits that'll have your valve sticking. So, normally I run car gas, but uh, on this cross country, 
yeah, I've been just under low lead for the last 15 hours of flying. I don't know if that makes any difference or not. But. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, heat, uh, heat and other things cause valves to stick. Uh, so it just, it is, ha it, it does happen. Uh, I look forward to the day uh, when uh, George Brawley and uh, Gammy gets their uh, STC done for uh, unleaded uh, Avgas. They're apparently that close to doing that. It's all good uh, and uh, it'll be good for us. Lead is, uh, it's, it's for detonation margin, but it's nasty. It's dirty. It always a bunch of crap inside the, uh, the cylinder on top of the piston and inside the top of the cylinder head and all that stuff. So, uh, one guy's asking what kind of engine you had. Uh, a G model, you had a C, a 470C? It's an E225-8. Oh, okay, so you had the pressure carb. That's right, you mentioned you used right. carb heat. Yeah, right. okay. Cool. So, if anybody's watching you want to throw a question out, uh, that would be great. Um, so, the question is, uh, how, uh, I'm a little unclear when this actually happened. I forgot when you posted your uh, story on beach talk uh, so have you recovered well, the date on it yeah have you recovered the airplane yeah i think it was the uh, 26th of july so not Sunday. that not that long ago three weeks ago i think yeah so have you gotten uh, gotten back home yet or uh, is it still in work yeah i my mechanic lives in knoxville which is Lafayette's kind of halfway in between. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so he was as close to the air, airplane as I was. And uh, it, my brother, by the way, was impressed. Nobody was at the airport, uncontrolled field. They had a, uh, frankly, that it was a frequency of the uh, common frequency for the airport was a combination to get in the door. So we're in there drinking the sodas and trying to figure out what we're going to do next. And um, Eventually, a guy drove up, and we asked him if he had a key to the courtesy car, which he did. He gave it to us, and we drove off. <laughs> so that worked out pretty well. Anyways, um, logistically, it was two days later that uh, my mechanic got there before I did, and he sent me a text saying he was going to have it fixed in an hour. And I, I didn't know what it was that he could fix in an hour, but uh, he he's strictly bonanzas. He does... He's been doing it for 20 years, and he knows what tools to bring. And uh, he knew right away because I had already fed him the information that number six had dropped on the EGT, so he kind of knew where to look. And uh, found the stuck valve and had all the reamers and everything he needed, the rope to uh, that's cool unstick that valve. So one fellow's asking, uh, uh, Ryan's asking, uh, who was the mechanic? A Quentin Elkins. Oh, cool. Cool. And then uh, another one, uh, somebody else, let's see, Sam is asking, uh, if you had identified it as the number six that had dropped off while you were flying, would you have done anything different? No. Uh, it, next time it happens, I'll suspect that's what it is. And it does affect your thinking. But no, the right thing is still put it down. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I got a little anecdotal story to tell. I did a video on this. Uh, it's called precautionary engine failure precautionary landing. Um, I was uh, flying in the, to Vegas and just past Peach Springs, which is out in the middle of nowhere. It's really nowhere. And uh, the engine run, started running a little rough. And I noticed that the uh, EGT is going up and down, up and down like this in a regular fashion. And what that is is a real indication normally. It's an indication of uh, the valve, the exhaust valve's failing. And uh, so it's letting uh, hot gas leak by during the, uh, the compression of burn stroke uh, before the exhaust stroke. And so it just fluctuates up and down. And that, that's an indication of an imminent failure. So in my mind, it's like, damn it, I'm not going to Vegas. I said I'm going to go to Kingman, and I started diverting towards Kingman. And just as I did that, I'm at 10.5 as well, but the terrain there is like, uh, the mountains are eight, 9,000 feet and the lowlands are five, 5,500. And uh, it started running really rough once I turned towards Kingman and I've still got mountains that are about 8,000 or 8,500 feet to cross. So I said, ah, I can't do that. So I looked at Four Flight and this is before they had the rings. 
but there was two airports real close to me. One was Halu the Hulapai, the Indian Air the Indian Nation Airport, and then there's another one called the uh, Grand Canyon uh, Caverns. You know, and and I, I, and the funny thing is, is I'd actually read a story about an AOPA about the trip there. They have a caverns in their own airport and a little hotel. So I'm going there. So I just did a great big Schuppenhausen turn, and I landed. And uh, in my case, it didn't. Uh, I pulled the power back, and I didn't really pay any attention much more. But it was the EGTs and the CHTs on that cylinder had dropped. You mentioned it dropping 500 degrees on yours. And when you looked at the EG, at the JPI data later, the engine data later, uh, mine had dropped like that, but the, the CHTs had dropped like you know, 250 degrees. It was almost nothing. So I thought, I just in my mind, I knew that I had the vet, the end, that cylinder's gone. So I put it on the ground and the cell phone didn't work. <laughs> Long story, but it turned out to be what it was, was that it failed was uh, two plugs on that cylinder were bad. They, they just decided to, I guess one was close and the other end had given up the ghost and they just quit. And that was my case and it turned out for the rest of the cylinders in the engine, um, let's see, about six of them were borderline. So I ended up replacing them all and uh, the engine ran. And then I replaced it fairly soon after that. But uh, So it's a kind of a similar situation in that you make a decision to divert and you do it. And uh, I think that's probably the best way to do it. See if anybody else has. So uh, Jim is asking if this is this incident has changed your approach to flying the Bonanza. Any? I probably go high more. High gives you time. It gives you options. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, that makes me remember what you said a little bit earlier about uh, using your speed. Uh, if you uh, if you need to go somewhere, best glide is the thing to do, as you say, range. So hit that, and that's you're going to go the farthest you can. But if you don't need the range, the distance, then uh, men sink is your best speed, or something close to that. So you can use the have more time in the air. And. Uh, you, you and actually when I do these engine outs, um, I do best glide until I get to the pattern, and then it's min sync. Uh, actually, actually, in the Bonanza, it's 81 knots uh, for uh, emergency approach speed, which is like five knots above min sync speed. And uh, my my take on it is is uh, at 76 knots, you try to flare, and there's no energy left in the airplane. So whatever descent rate you can. <laughs> That's what you're going to have when you hit the ground. So it's always good to have a little well, bit. The only thing I'll add to that is that speed-wise, every case is different. And uh, in my case, I had an abundance of energy. I had to piss some away somehow. And I had an engine that I had visions of blowing a whole cylinder or something very catastrophic. And uh, that's why I didn't. Temp fate by asking me out of it, and I was in a hurry to get on the ground. I had the yeah. energy to do it. Yeah, I think it's excellent. Uh, I, I think the important point to remember here is is that when you're airborne, it's not time to troubleshoot what happened. I mean, if you can't, you you say when you run the throttle up and it starts running rough. Well, okay, it could be you blew a cylinder off and the engine's still running. It happened in happens in radials quite often, so. You know, it's, well, okay, I'm landing. That's what I'm doing. I'm committed to something. You commit to a course of action, and you execute it. Don't troubleshoot in flight. Plenty of time on the ground to figure uh, that out. Just two points that I want. I, I breezed over. I just want to emphasize. In my view, uh, when we practice these engine out approaches, we cannot put the pitch in course. Uh, by doing that, by putting the pitch in course, you're going to have less drag on the airplane, you're going to go further. But in the case of a pra practice scenario, you want to be able to go around. So at least towards the end there, you, you need to go to take off pitch on the prop, which is maybe neg negligible, maybe not, as far as um, how far you can float to the runway. 
And um, the other thing I already mentioned was a slip that uh, we really shouldn't be using that while we practice, but it is available. In fact, that that effort to land on the first part of a field, I think is pretty important. I mean, you don't want to touch down with too much airspeed. You want to land there in the touchdown attitude and have the whole field there to, to be able to roll out and stop. But you can't come up short. And mm -hmm. it seems to me like you can work that slip like a throttle coming down final and maintain your glide path pretty well and your energy. Put it where you want to on speed. Yeah. But absolutely. you can't practice that. It's hard to, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, yeah, in a Bonanza, other airplanes, sure, but in a Bonanza, I would not recommend uh, practicing a slip. Uh, but the prop pitch, I actually, um, it's probably worth about five to six hundred uh, feet per minute in the descent. Um, so if you're, and that's one thing as I talk about when you, when you turn pit, you know, then you try to get, turn, I'm, I'm going towards the field, I set best glide, and then I do like you said and try to figure out if I get the engine running again. If I can't get it running again, I'm committed now to this is going to be a forced landing. And then I pull the prop back. And if and I do that in practice as well, just kind of practice my flow to get that engine started again. And then uh, I pull the prop back. And uh, then in the practice, I just did that video for the Pro Flying series. And you hear me talk about it. I actually put the prop back in, you know, <laughs> because I want to go around here in a minute and uh, or I might need to go around and I need that engine. So I'm not going to land in a practice with it in the uh, in, uh, course. So I'm, I'm with you on that. Absolutely. Let's see. Ryan's asking uh, during what phase of flight are we seeing stuck valves? I, honestly, I don't think um, I don't think you can say that any particular phase of flight is going to be conducive to a stuck valve or not. It's just how it's been, how that. Well, you know, at 10,500, uh, I was wide open throttle and probably seeing not even 60% power on the engine. And we were getting towards the end of a, we've probably been cruising for two hours at that point. And uh, if you look at that EAA video, it talks about cool uh, temperatures causing this buildup. I may have let number six, which is right out there in the breeze, uh, it may have dropped down below 350 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm trying to keep them below 400 and, and up until now I had not been that mindful about having them above 350. So I might have been asking for it in that regard. Well, I don't necessarily think so. Uh, that's a, a discussion. Temperatures on the cylinder heads uh, uh, is a discussion for another time, really. But uh, I think that it just happens. And you did you uh, have you been operating this engine since it was overhauled, or it was uh, well, how many hours? I've operated did... it for seven years. Put about uh, I got it with four hundred and put about three hundred on it since. Okay. So there's the that's the issue is if if you don't. Uh, uh, if you don't, if you're not operating the engine from the very beginning, from its overall or uh, brand new, then you actually don't know how well it's going to do. You know, it's kind of a bit of a crapshoot. Whenever I get an airplane, I have a disease. I have, air, I like airplanes, but whenever I get an airplane, my wife's first question is, "Is okay? So when are you going to buy a new engine?" <laughs> That's that is a problem I have. <laughs> so. Anyway, if nobody has any other questions, uh, do you have any other comments you'd like to, to throw out? Because we've been doing this for a little bit, I think so. Well, I think somewhere embedded in this is um, don't take an airplane that has some subsystem that isn't working right because you don't know what's going to happen and um, it's, it's just best to start out with a good airplane anyway. Yeah. And uh, practice this stuff in advance. That's about it. Yeah. Well, I, I'm right with you. I totally, I think one of the big lessons learned is, is you were actually talking about this. So you've made a lot of decisions 
in your mind about what to do before it ever happened. I mean, not that you were foreshadowing that it was going to actually happen to you, but in case you're thinking about it in case and you're planning it and you've actually practiced it in the past. All that's good stuff and my nickel on the grass to other people out there watching would be go ahead and practice this. You know, have some, uh, have some familiarity with this kind of stuff. So if it ever happens, I'll, I'll do an occasional BFR, and I'm really surprised that how many private pilots just haven't even thought about what they're going to do if they lose an engine. I mean, they they're going to find the best field is what they do, and they just kind of aim the airplane towards it and try to land. They don't think about restarting the engine or uh, best glide speed and all the other stuff we just talked about. Right, and especially a checklist. That's what one of my big emphasis items when it's all done. Look at the checklist if you have the time. Uh, pass it to a passenger if you have one, and uh, have them help you out. Excellent words. Excellent advice. All right. Well, I appreciate it. I think there's a lot of good lessons learned, and uh, uh, I think you did a great job, and that's why I wanted to have you on here, and uh, we could share that with other people. So thanks for joining us, okay. Jeff. I appreciate it. Thanks. And thanks I hope you don't get stuff. called. I hope, you bet. I hope you don't get called back for training real soon. Uh, August 31st, I'm on my way. <laughs> okay. All right, well, thanks for watching. See you next time on Flywire.